to the point with Congressman Bill Pascrell, focusing on the concerns and issues facing the families of New Jersey's 9th Congressional District. Hi, I'm uh, Congressman Bill Pascrell, 9th Congressional District, and we're here with To The Point. Oh, we got a special guest today. Uh, knock your eyeballs out. Frank Lobianda. He's the congressman all the way down the southern part of New Jersey. Uh, we went into the uh, uh, Assembly of Jersey Legislature together in, in 1988, January 88. We served there together. He went on to Congress a term before me. He was in the Gingrich Revolution. Uh, I won because of the Gingrich Revolution the next time in, uh, in uh, 96. And I took office in the Congress in January of 97. I'm honored to have served with him. He's leaving the, the Congress, not because he got defeated, uh, but because Mary it really get, became much smarter than the rest of us. And uh, he's ready to do something else. He worked with his, his father, built a beautiful trucking business in South Jersey. I remember the time he drove me all over South Jersey. I thought I was going to another state or another planet or something. He's, I think it's one-fourth of the entire state, isn't it? Try 40%. 40% of the entire state. That's not fair. That's not democracy. Well, it's a people. We're not talking about square mileage when we, when we break down. So we're honored to have him here, and it's a great pleasure, Frank. And thank you for coming aboard. Well, thank you. And we've worked hard together on a lot of good projects together, and I can't think of a better person that I met in the Congress even there you are of the quote-unquote other party, uh, than Frank Lobiond. Uh Good family man, good for the entire state of New Jersey, good for the nation. Uh, what you've done uh, in aviation, what you've done with the Coast Guard on transportation, I think you served on the committee for 25 years? No, 22. I'm sorry, 22 years. Not the total time you were here. And uh, so you did penance the first couple of years like I did, like everybody does. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you've done such a great job in transportation. And the epitome of it, the, the, the other day, folks, was we named the Coast, Coast Guard bill after Frank Lobianda. Congratulations. Yeah, I'm not sure how that happened, but thank you. It happened. Okay. It happened. So, Frank, give us a synopsis. All you've been through, how you got here, how you made that decision. Well, we probably don't have enough time for the whole story, but let me also uh, thank you because when people ask me uh, what it's like now that I'm leaving, and I, I say it's, it's very bittersweet. I'm not going to miss the drama. I'm not going to miss some of the other things that are going on, but I'm going to miss the relationships. And at the top of that list is Bill Pascrell. We've been through a lot together in the state of New Jersey. We've been a lot through a lot together here. And if we had been able to convince our leadership to let the two of us decide the agenda, we'd have a balanced budget, world peace, we'd eliminate That's world right. hunger, we, we would have fixed it all. And I told that to Bill Clinton when he was the president about you. Because, <laughs> he because let us do it though. <laughs> the relationship we've had is what is missing from a large part of right. this congressional body, where members of the opposite party can look at issues, right. can find common ground. And, you know, I started out as a freeholder in Cumberland County. I didn't seek office. They sort of came after me. One thing led to another. Uh, both our paths led here to Washington. Uh, we've encountered a lot of issues. We worked on a lot of things for New Jersey together. Oh, yeah. And, you know, there is a big difference, as you said. We, we should be a separate state. South Jersey should have been a separate state. <laughs> we got very little from North Jersey. Don't start up again, Frank. But, but you were one of the ones who understood South Jersey. You knew where Atlantic City was. You knew about beach replenishment. Oh, yeah. You knew about the FAA Tech Center. You knew about the only Coast Guard recruit training center in the nation. Nobody even knew it was there. No, nobody even knew it was there. Right. And always and repeatedly came to me and said, what could I do to help? And whenever I asked, you did. So that's what's made up our relationship and why we've, I think I've enjoyed some degree of getting some things done because of working together with people like you. Leg legislatively, Frank, I can remember, uh, you know, a lot of things stick out in your mind. But with you, what sticks out in my mind, uh, not more than anything else, but it, it's one of the things that sticks out in my mind, is how you thought of the entire state when we got attacked by nature 
and Sandy. Uh, you were the first one to run point on this, not to accept. Why should we accept one penny less than what went to the state of Louisiana and Mississippi and all those states down there with that her great hurricane during the Bush administration? Why people didn't understand that? And then I went to Texas on, on storms uh, in Republican areas. They, they greeted me like I was bringing medicine to the people there as I came down in, my hel in the helicopter just to see what it was like. And canopies, blue canopies over every roof. We took care of those people because we're Americans. When Sandy came, those same people voted not to send any funds. How could this be? You persisted. You persisted. And you took the rest of us along with you, really. And we're still fighting today. Could you imagine? Yeah. We are still fighting for equality and equity in the storms that hit, whether it was Texas, uh, Louisiana, whether it was New Jersey. What's the difference? We're all Americans. What are we going to go check the denominations of what's got, who the people are in those great fires out in California? Is it, are these blue people or red people? What are, what are we, crazy? You persist. Tell, tell us, give us a brief synopsis. Well, none of us really expected to be impacted by Sandy the way it was. We knew that a big storm was coming. Right. We knew we were due. Right. But it was always going to be next year or sometime in the yeah. future. And Mostly wind. Mostly wind and the flooding from Back Bay, not, That's correct. not from the ocean. And just as the Hackensack River flooded Monaki and Little Ferry. Right. So when all this hit, we knew we had a big challenge on our hands. But I was pretty confident because in the history of our country, the entire 200 plus years, right. when there was a natural disaster. We're there. We're always there. Right. Earthquake, hurricane, yeah. tornado, whatever it may no be. No red and blue states. I never expected that we would have people from my own party, the Republican Party, say, we're going to change the rules now. <laughs> now that it's New Jersey, we're going to change the rules. Yeah. And at first, I was taking it personally, and I still take it personally. Being Sicilian, you know what that means. That means, that's right. That means We're both Italians, but you're Sicilian. That laminated long <laughs> list still holds. Right. And when at least you and your colleagues and the Democrats and in the state of New Jersey, we all held together. And thanks to a couple of us, Peter King and a few of us, who would not accept this tragedy that they were trying that's to right. put on us. Um, and you remember that year we were here New Year's Eve. That's correct. We were here New Year's Eve because we had been promised this would be fixed. Right. And, and they wanted to get past that current Congress where we had a lot of friends on our side who had committed to do this. Right. And they wanted a new Congress. That's correct. Where there were freshmen who didn't understand the thing. Saying so it like it is. We and I remember, I remember calling my wife on New Year's Eve. <laughs> I thought I was back in the service. <laughs> calling my wife on New Year's Eve and telling her, she says, I don't believe you're in Washington doing this. I says, <clears throat> so I put John Larson on the phone. <laughs> he was my backup. And I, I went to bed on New Year's Eve, 1030. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a bad shape. I was, I, you know, I, I couldn't believe we were down there. And, you know, the, with the people that we helped, it's a difficult thing to even look at them and talk to them, which we need to do, uh, because they voted. Why did you vote no against us? What the hell did we do again to you? Well, we got to watch every dime. Of course you got to watch every dime. Well, you may recall in my floor remarks on one occasion, I wanted to congratulate the members of Congress from Florida because they weren't going to have any hurricanes anymore. They yeah, didn't need to worry about it. <laughs> I wanted to congratulate California because they weren't going to have any earthquakes yeah. anymore. Yeah. And warned all of them, you'll have your day. You'll have your day. And to this day, we have people who have just suffered natural disasters that are begging for something to be done five minutes ago when they held us up for months and months and months. So the suffering of the people that you and I represented meant nothing. The suffering of their people mean more than the suffering of our people? That's what's really egregious. So I hope it's a chapter that's never repeated Do in you, the future. You carry the list on, uh, on your pocket. It's laminated. It's la 
of the, of, the, of the Republicans who voted no on this? Oh, yes. On the Sandy? Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I carry some. I carry, the only two things I carry all the time is the Constitution. I carry that. Because I'd rather watch paint dry on a wall than when I was in high school. But I read Well, everything. that was a special caucus. You remember what I termed it, the hypocrisy caucus. Hypocrisy caucus. Yeah. <laughs> you got <Hypocrisy>. eliminated. <laughs> so the laminated list is for the hypocrisy caucus who decided that they were going to change the rules for New Jerseyans. Right. And that's just flat <laughs> wrong. And I, the other thing I carry all the time is the list of the folks from my district who died on 9-11. That's the two things I carry uh, all the time. Um, what have been, what is, what's been your approach to coalitions, Frank, since you've been here, and has it changed? Is it easier, more difficult? Um, it's something that works. Uh, the bipartisan coalitions, we call them working groups, call yeah. them what you want that we put together. We find common ground, and um, I don't know your experience, but my experience is that when I first got here, they were much easier to form, and they were much easier to get a result with. Why? Why is that? I think it's the overall mentality of both our parties, and I think both our parties share some blame in this. Uh, we get tied up in rhetoric, uh, sometimes from our leadership, that shuts people down. Um, we, had, we, we had the creation of the Freedom Caucus. Right. Uh, the Freedom Caucus, when that was created, intimidated a lot of people. We, we have... Re Republican media outlets that spent more time attacking Republicans, yeah. finding primary opponents for Absolutely. Republicans, than getting a solution for a problem that was affecting all of us. And you know, in this past election, the one good thing I think that came out, a lot of young people are in, a lot of new people are in, a good diverse population. But what I find fascinating is when you look into the numbers, remember that was my job before I became uh, off, seeking off, someone seeking office. That when you look into the weeds, you find out that moderate Democrats won most of the primaries and were the reason why they won the general elections. That's a healthy thing in our party. There may be three or four, five who stick out as maybe extreme in certain areas. They don't have the day. And I don't ever get the impression that they have the day. So I think that's a healthy thing. Now. When we were freshmen, we come in here like Mickey Mouse. These freshmen think they know all the answers, some of them. And I, I think you're going to see a little bit of that, and that's up to leadership to work it out. But I believe in a bottom-up kind of listening channel so that it's not just top-down, this is what you're going to do. If we get back to regular order and the chairman have their authority and their power and the, and the committees, and in the subcommittees, I think that's a better Congress. Do you agree or disagree? Oh, absolutely. I think that's what it was designed to be. Yeah. And both of our parties at a point in time got away from it. Uh, I think it uh, hampered the ability of the institution to get things done. And I think in some respects it hampered our ability as members to work together um, because the framework wasn't allowed to be in place for us to be able to utilize that energy that we create when we get together right. and we're from different parties. And that's powerful. It's powerful. Frank, you've had a great relationship with organized labor uh, down in South Jersey. Um, why are so many of the people in your party afraid to get into those kinds of relationship? When these are working people, these are people that, that exist and work in our districts. Why are we so afraid, or some people in your party afraid, to taking that into consideration? I don't understand that. Uh, hard for me to understand as well. Um, so you mentioned uh, my background in working in our family trucking business. So I sort of had a firsthand example because we were a full Teamster operation. Teams, whole truck income. Teamster truck drivers, right. Teamster mechanics, Teamster dock workers. And you survived. And I was the one who, after I got my feet in the business, was tasked with negotiating the contracts and then dealing with the working rules. First hand. So if, if there was a union member who came in who had a grievance, 
we sat down, and in the, in the beginning it was a little bit rough, but uh, in 25 years, I didn't have a grievance that left the barn because when we were wrong, we were wrong. When they were wrong, they were wrong. And I got to see that this picture that was painted of union operations, that they were trying to put companies out of business and this other nonsense that's out there, was just not true. I got in a little bit of trouble with Tom DeLay from time to time <laughs> when we had some issues coming before our conference right. that were pure anti-union measures. They're still doing it. That I had to get up and say, listen, I was in management. Here's my experience. Now, if you're from Montana, if you're from Idaho, you got a whole different ballgame on your hands. Right. But if you're from the Northeast and some of these populated areas, I find it hard to believe. And I refuse to accept that you can't be pro-labor and pro-business. I was one of I the agree. only ones who was endorsed by the Chamber of Commerce and endorsed by the AFL-CIO at Me the too. same time. Me too. That, so, I, when I ran for Congress, I was endorsed by both. Yeah, so it's, it's not mutually exclusive. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Frank, you've been in this business for uh, 24 years? At this end. What's, what's your future? What are you going to do? What do you want to do? Well... I've been fortunate to have great committee assignments after I got over the hump that you talked about. Right. So uh, transportation, I've chaired Coast Guard and Maritime, a lot of maritime experience uh, for more than half my time here. Uh, just coming off of chairing aviation, I think I've developed a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise. Absolutely. Been on armed services almost the whole time. And although it took me a lot of years to convince John Boehner to put me on the Intelligence Committee, I'm finishing, I'm term limiting out on intelligence where I've been chairing the CIA. Wow. Now, if I put all that together with some 30 plus trips on armed services and CIA, wow. most of them into Africa, some places that most people don't want to go. Right. And we've been on some trips together yeah. where people won't go. Up <laughs> you to saw the, me fire those weapons. Up to the Pakistan, <laughs> Af you Afghanistan <laughs> border. Uh, so I'd like to think that uh, I could really help out with those issues somewhere along the line. Of course, a lot of people don't give it the thought, but we have some very strict ethics rules here, which I'm very conscious of to make sure that uh, I don't cross any lines winding up. So you really, can't, you, will. you really can't talk a whole lot before you leave. Uh, but as this winds down to January 3rd at 11.59 a.m., uh, <laughs> I'm hopeful to make a connection that allows me to stay involved with the issues that I've spent a lot of time in with. In any way I can be of help, you know that, Frank. Oh, I'm going to call you. And, but any way I can be of help, I'm serious. You've been such a great plus for the institution. You know, I talk about the institution. You said Pascal, he shoots his mouth off on a lot of things, but he really has a respect. That's what I want people to say about me. I have a respect for the institution. Equal branches of government. Don't try to put anything over on me, Bush, Obama, whatever your name is. Don't try to put anything on me because I'm not going to accept it. I didn't accept it in trade. I didn't accept it on intel. I want to know what's going on in America. People have a right to know. On trade, Article 1, Section 8 is perfectly clear. We have control of commerce. You'd never know it under Democratic and Republican presidents. We've surrendered our options. And then we wonder why we get bad trade deals. And, and, and this president now we have now, he was all wrong about blaming immigrants for outsourcing of jobs. The outsourcing of jobs because countries like Mexico don't respect their workers. They can't even have a, a private contract. They can't have a private boat. So we got to straighten that all out. We got to straighten that all out. You made the legislative branch of government what it should be. You did everything you possibly could as one person. We have no excuses to, to, to lay down, sit in our hands and say, oh, what was me? You didn't accept that. You didn't accept the status quo. You are, you are uh, an anomaly <laughs> in the Congress, Frank, and you are going to be missed. And I'm glad that before this was over, you introduced me to your beautiful brother, a Jesuit priest, and who's a great guy also. So your, your parents must be so proud of all you. How many brothers and sisters do you have? Just two older brothers. Two older brothers. And one of them is a Jesuit. The middle one's a Jesuit. Yeah, and he's still going. Yeah, he's still going. He's the uh, rector at Gonzaga. 
He was the executive director. They got a good basketball team. Yeah. Well, Gonzaga High School, but they're, oh, good. High they're, school. Good, they're good in sports. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was the executive director of the Woodstock Institute for a lot of years. That's right. He was a missionary in Chile. Wow. And when things went really sideways in around 1970, and he had been working with a very poor area in Osorno, mm -hmm. Chile, uh, he came back and realized that he could have a bigger impact if he changed policy. And instead of helping out people one, two, ten at a time, if you change policy and gave people an economic opportunity, that that would be the biggest thing. So the Jesuits had a think tank called the Woodstock Institute, housed at Georgetown well. University. I went to Fordham, so I know this. Um, <laughs> I got to be there target. with some of the most brilliant minds in the world in different areas. Yeah. But just like everything else, uh, the Jesuit uh, Maryland province could not sustain it. So a few years ago, uh, while he was director, he was he was directed to close the institute. Oh yeah, it's really tough. That was a tough one. Tough. It's very see. tough for him. But um, and he's a little bit older than me, and um, I'm a little bit up there myself. So uh, having the opportunity to be the rector of Gonzaga and work with the students and give them retreats and do a lot of the things he's doing there, uh, not actually teaching courses but working with the whole student population. And there's also the McKenna Center that's right there that takes care of homeless people. Right, right, it's right, over right. by Union Station. So he's, he's very happy with what he's doing. Let me ask you a question. Uh, which time, you, you, so you served for your 24 years. Which period did you like the best? Well, um, well, you know, initially you come in as a freshman, yeah. and Republicans were never supposed to win that year. So Republican leadership was not prepared to take over. Uh, and that first year, um, you, you were lucky you missed it. Uh, we had no schedule. Uh, if we got finished 11 or 12 o'clock at night, we were happy. It was basically five days a week. Wow. And after six months, I'm still not sure I knew where the bathrooms were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Especially if you were in the Longworth or the, or the uh, Rayburn building. The Rayburn building, <laughs> yeah, you get lost in there. Um, but after we settled down a little bit, um, as tragic as September 11th was, I think that the way for that period of time we came together, we weren't Republicans or we weren't right. Democrats, right. and we focused on what we could do to protect the country. Um, that was a very special period of when we came together. Who stood up? Who stands up? Who stands up? And... Um, you know, we had then, then Republicans sort of got uh, sidetracked a little bit. Democrats took control in 2006. Uh, that was not a particularly fun period for me. Uh, I'm sure it was different for try, you. Try, try going to the uh, uh, town meetings, and if you're a Democrat in uh, 2009, <laughs> on the Affordable Care Act. And I ran on the act because I wasn't going to run against it. I really believed in it. I didn't was unable to get done what I wanted to get done in it as we were writing it. But I think it was a good start. We should have made many changes afterwards. That wasn't possible because we lost the majority and they tried to get rid of the thing. Mm. But that was a difficult time. That was a very difficult, a difficult time. time. And we, when we came, became the majority in 2006, we had this big brainy idea before we get into healthcare. We were doing the carbon tax and all of that stuff. And the Senate wasn't going to bring it up. True. So we sent our w toughest district people out to defend this, even though we voted for it. We started off on the wrong foot before we even got into ACA. That I remember it clearly day by day almost. For crying yeah. out loud. And I think that gave birth to uh, the, the flip in 2010, which was really the creation of the Freedom Caucus. Yeah. And for the Republicans, it led to a whole new headache. The, the, uh, the uh, part, what they call themselves? Tea so? Party. Tea Party. Tea Party morphed into the, uh, into the Freedom Caucus. Yeah. And the, the Main Street group that I've been a part of for all these years, the really moderate Republicans, the Republicans uh, who wanted to get a result, who wanted to work across the aisle, who understood labor issues, who understood environmental issues, right. uh, we were really diminished when that happened. And uh, there was a greater voice uh, crying out from, from that particular group. And that was the tail wagging the dog for us. Uh, it was a particularly tough time. 
Uh, they listened to some nonsense about what should be done. We ended up with a 17-day government shutdown. Um, I, I didn't. I wasn't elected here to shut the government down right. or to do any of that stuff. So that was a particularly tough time. But having a chance to uh, to chair aviation, and we've had the first long-term five-year FAA reauthorization bill since 1982. That's what we needed in trans infrastructure. It's a five-year plan. Get back to that idea. We did that under Democratic leadership. We did it under Republican leadership. Bob Rowe. Bill Schuster, yeah. <clears throat> Jim Overstar, yeah, right yeah. down the line here, right down the line. We got to get back to that. We do, but in, in terms for me, uh, getting the waiver to chair both aviation and CIA were two areas that I was so inspired and motivated by and just loved the opportunity to do that. So uh, as though the political waters were troubled in the last couple of years. And we've talked about this before. I was always in the political crosshairs because my district was what was considered a D plus district. Your biggest threat was a, was a primary, primary fight. Primary. Uh, so five minutes after the polls closed, I was a target of the DCCC. Right, right. Uh, just the way it is. We raise our hand. Nobody should feel sorry for us. Please vote for me. <laughs> but it's a little bit different than somebody's from a plus 14 district or right. plus 10 district. But having those chairmanships and having a chance to impact policy that really makes a difference in the country that was really nonpartisan right. aviation. Rick Larson is fabulous to work with. Right. I'd, I'd, I'd go anywhere with him at any time. He was great to work with. Uh, the Intel Committee was kind of the same thing. So I feel that, um, you know, you, you have to pick a time and place. And Kenny Rogers was right about knowing when to hold them and fold them. That's correct. So Great chairman. I'm, uh, I'm feeling pretty good about where it is. Frank, I can't tell you how appreciative I am that you did this before, you know, this is not your swan song probably, but that you did this before you, you left the institution, but you never really leave here, Frank. You have so many people who really love you as a human being. Well, you've been a good friend for a lot of years, and nobody can take those things away. You know, we have issues that go up and down and sideways, but the relationship and the friendships last forever. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Bill. And good, and good luck to you and your family. Okay. Thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, our address and phone number will appear. We've got a great American. Thanks, Bill. We're going to miss him. God bless you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for watching. <laughs>